Okay, good morning if you're watching on the internet. Welcome to Hope and Door Bible Church, West Ossipee, New Hampshire. We are in Acts chapter 28 today, the very last chapter. The end of the story as it's recorded. Before I start, let me remind you of the two verses I've been reminding you of for the last few weeks. Acts chapter 9, verses 15 and 16. This was the first time Paul was telling his story, his testimony. And this, he's talking about this guy who's going to be a part of his story. God speaks to this guy. This is the guy who's going to go with him into the city. But the Lord said to him, go, for he, he is Paul. He is a chosen vessel of mine to bear my name before Gentiles, kings, and the children of Israel. For I will show him how many things he must suffer for my name's sake. And Paul has indeed suffered for Jesus' name's sake. Mark chapter 13, verse 11. This is Jesus' instructions. But when they arrest you, well, that was Paul. And they deliver you up. That's Paul. Do not worry beforehand or premeditate what you will speak. But whatever is given you in that hour, speak that. But it is not you who speak, but the Holy Spirit. So last week we left uh, Paul in a very uh, dramatic place. The ship was being torn up. Those who could swim or jump it into the water. Those who couldn't swim. Never tells me if Paul was a swimmer or not. Those who couldn't swim were grabbing onto logs and planks that were being torn off the back of the ship as it was being broken up. And they floated up onto the beach. And just like Paul had declared, all of the souls would be saved, though the ship would be destroyed. And Paul was indeed saved. And the entire crew and all those with him were saved. Gets us in today's chapter. Chapter 28, the first two verses. Now when they escaped, they found out that the island was called Malta. And the natives showed us unusual kindness. So they kindled a fire and made us all welcome. Because of the rain that was falling and because of the cold. Now, these were experienced sailors. They would have known the island of Malta, except they knew it from the other side. The other side was where the port was. They'd been blown around on the other side of the island. Not a side they'd ever seen as they were sailing, not a side they recognized. They knew the island, they just didn't know how to recognize it from where they were. Verse two, made us welcome because of the rain that was falling and because of the cold. Now, Luke's writing this firsthand. Luke was there. Luke was cold. Luke had swum to shore. Now, he's experienced all this firsthand. So he's really appreciating the kindness of these natives. Now, Paul's safe. Everything's good. We're gonna build a fire. We're gonna have a cookout. He's excited. Verses 3 through 6. But when Paul had gathered a bundle of sticks and laid them on the fire, a viper came out because of the heat and fastened on his hand. He's got his hand by the fire and the snake's now bit and is holding on to his hand. So when the natives saw the creature hanging from his hand, they said to one another, no doubt this man is a murderer, whom though he has escaped the sea, yet justice does not allow him to live. But he shook off the creature into the fire and suffered no harm. However, they were expecting that he would swell up or suddenly fall down dead. But after they had looked for a long time and saw no harm had come to him, they changed their minds and said that he was a god. People are so fickle. All right, so verse three. He gathers a bundle of sticks. Now, this is the Apostle Paul. Uh, by the way, this is the old Apostle Paul. He's now getting on in years. 
There were 276 passengers on the ship. He gave us the number in the last chapter. There were guys there more qualified to go out and pick up sticks than Paul was. But Paul's, Paul's the type of guy that would help. He had a servant's heart. He had picking up sticks. I'm going to pick up sticks. All right? It says a viper came out because of the heat and fastened on his hand. Now, Paul's a faithful servant of the true and living God. That didn't keep him from having a problem. You can be a faithful servant of the true and living God and still lose your power steering. Mm -hmm. yeah. Still have your car break down. Yeah. Still have your checkbook bounce. Mm -hmm. We're not immune from problems. Problems happen to Christians. It's okay. Get used to it. But Paul didn't throw a fit. He didn't look around and say, Look God, I'm serving you. Why is this thing on my hand? How come? He didn't look at the people and say, if you guys are going out and pick up sticks, this wouldn't happen to me. He just kept on going. I don't find in here him complaining any place. Now, if there's a snake hanging from my hand, chances are you're going to hear me say something. I'm human. I wouldn't like the thing hanging from my hand. But he shook it off. And he just kept going. Now, the natives are watching all this. They've come to the conclusion, no doubt this man is a murderer. Now, notice the words, yet justice does not allow him to live. Now, what picture do you get in your head when it says, now justice doesn't allow him to live? You got a picture? You got a concept of justice? Your concept is wrong. It's not what the story is telling you. Okay. Justice was the name of a Greek god. Gee, now we got that one before, Pastor. Okay. There was a Greek god of justice. The Greek name was Deke, D I K E E. They're thinking this god's not going to allow Paul to get away with whatever he's done. So their, their concept of justice was not your concept, not right and wrong. It's what's this Greek God going to decide? Now, Paul's come. He shakes off the creature into the fire. And he doesn't suffer any harm. Why does Paul not suffer any harm? You can talk to me if you want. Okay? I want a real specific answer. God's taking care of him. What did God promise him? You're going to go to Rome. If he dies with a snake bite, he can't get to Rome. God said, you're going to Rome. Is a snake fastened to Paul's hand going to keep him from getting to Rome? No. Nope. God said Paul's going to Rome. Paul believes it. Away, snake. Paul's not expecting to die because he knows I'm going to Rome. So, you know. By the way, you guys that read the Bible every day, that read promises every day. Live like it. Live like God's taking care of us. Live like we get the promises of God. By the way, Paul could take God's past faithfulness as a promise of his future faithfulness. Did you get that? Paul looked at God's past faithfulness to him, and he knew God would be faithful in the future. How many of you God has been faithful to you? You think he's going to stop now? He's going to keep on being faithful. He's going to keep on taking care of you. Whether you can see how it works out or not, God's going to take care of you. Now the natives who are quick to jump to conclusions, first jump to the conclusion that Paul must have been a murderer. That didn't work out. So Paul must be a God. That's a God with a small g. He was. All right. Now, Luke. Luke is my very detailed guy. Remember, Luke's a physician. He's got training. He wrote prescriptions with handwriting you couldn't read. I mean, he was a real doctor. So he's going to give you some details. Verses 7 through 10. And in that region, there was an estate of the leading citizen. Underline leading citizen in your Bible. 
You don't know her yet, but it's important. Okay. Leading citizen of the island, whose name was Publius, who received us and entertained us courteously for three days. Now, that's Paul, that's Luke, that's everybody that's traveling with them. And it happened that the father of Publius lay sick of a fever and dysentery. Paul went into him and prayed, laid his hands on him, and healed him. Wow. There's a testimony for everybody. Now, let's read what it says next. So when this was done, the rest of those on the island who had diseases also came and were healed. Now, you're reading the story at face value with me. So, these people, this horde of people who had diseases, who came and were healed, who healed them? God's a safe answer. Give me an unsafe answer. Where did my volume go, Terry? The Holy Spirit. Excuse me? Oh, I'm sorry. That's why I turned it down. You're good. Okay, can you guys still hear me all right? Okay, so, who do you think healed all these people? I understand God. Give me a, per, give me a person name. Jesus. Holy Spirit. Give me a name from a character in the story. Who healed these sick people? Paul? How many think Paul? How many think Luke? How many of you are too scared to give me an answer? <laughs> okay. I'm not going to tell you now just because of that. But I'll get to it. They also honored us in many ways. And when we had to, by the way, underline in many ways. I got to get you the whole story here. And when we departed, they provided such things as were necessary. So, verse 7 the leading citizen of the island. I had you underline leading citizen who received us and entertained us courteously for three days. This was a great blessing and a strong contrast to what they've been through for the two weeks before, where everybody was sick, that no sun, no, no nothing. I mean, they were miserable for two weeks. Now they're being treated well. Leading citizen of the island. Leading citizen's father. Okay. That's the guy who was sick. I know, but he no. Okay. Leading a citizen of the island is a technical term. It is the term for the Roman representative in that community. He was to go between between the natives and the Roman government. So he's like a governor. So he has an official Rome title and Rome job. All right. His father, Publius, lay sick of fever and dysentery. Now, the com commentators I read said that most people believe he had what was known as Malta fever. Strange, he was in Malta, so that kind of makes sense. Malta fever comes from a microorganism found in the milk of Maltese goats. I would not have known that if I had not studied it. His symptoms usually lasted about four months, and then you get better or you die. There was not a lot of in between at the four month mark. So this guy's dad was headed in the wrong direction. Paul goes in, lays hands on him, prays for him, and he's healed. God does it. God works through Paul. It's a miracle. Everybody there recognizes the miracle. Verse 9. I'm going to do it in English, but eventually I'm going to come back and have to get you to think in Greek. The rest of those in the island who had diseases also came and were healed. Now, that term, were healed. I read it to you in English and you think, yep, they're healed. Paul healed them. The word in Greek, and I'm not even going to try to pronounce the word in Greek, but the word in Greek is not a word for a miraculous healing. It's a word for receiving medical attention. Mm -hmm. Now, Luke's a doctor. Mm -hmm. He knows what word to pick. 
in the couple of verses before he used a word that said miracle in this verse he's using a word that means received medical attention what to look through for a living he's a doctor by the time they were on the island Luke worked as a medical missionary and worked to heal these people of their various ailments now I don't know if Luke's got a black bag with him or not, but he certainly knows what herbs and things to put together to help treat people. So, this was probably not miraculous healings through Paul. This was probably medical attention through Luke. By the way, I know that because where it says they honored us in many ways, that term in Greek is a term that will be used for medical pain. Well, I can tie the pieces together. Now, I'm not a Greek expert, but I'm taking the word of Greek experts when they tell me this. So, they had an impact for good on the island. Christians ought to have an impact for good every place we go. All right, verses 11 through 15. Paul's going to continue his journey towards Rome. After three months, so he's three months on the island of Malta. Remember, he's on the wrong side of Malta. So there's some walking to be done. Took him some time. After three months, we sailed in an Alexandrian ship whose figurehead was the twin brothers. That's the fancy cow piece on the front of the ship. Which had wintered at the island. And landing at Syracuse, we stayed three days. So they made a stop on the way to Rome in a place called Syracuse, not New York. From there, we circled around and reached Regia. And after one day, the south wind blew, and the next day we came to Padoli. Sounds like an Italian city to me. Where we found brother, and were invited to stay with them seven days. So we went towards Rome. And when he says we went towards Rome, he's now walking towards Rome. And from there, the brother had heard about us, and they came to meet us as far as Appi Forum and Three Inns. Those are the names of two places. When Paul saw them, he thanked God and took courage. So verse 11, they spent three months on Malta gathering strength, waiting for the winter to end, and walking to the other side of the island. First place they stopped, verse 12, was Syracuse. Syracuse was a famous city in the ancient world and it was the capital of Sicily. So by the time they stopped there, they were in Italy. It gives you two more cities in verse 13, Regium and Pertoli. Now, in your head, get a map of Italy in your head. These two places were on the toe of the boot of Italy. Remember Italy is shaped like a boot? So he's now on the toe of the boot. But he's on mainland Italy. All right, verse 14. We found brethren and were invited to stay with them seven days. So they had seven days of fellowship with other believers in Jesus. Isn't it neat how God just provides us opportunities to witness? I've been in many faraway places and we found Christians, we found churches, we found God's people to be with and to fellowship with. And it's always a joy and a blessing. We went to a church in Switzerland that spoke German. I didn't know a word of German. They didn't know much English. So I sat there through the singing and the message in German. Now the pastor, bless his heart, when he did the benediction, did it in English for us. Mm -hmm. But even though I didn't understand a word he was saying, we were blessed that we were fellowshipping. I don't gotta understand the words. I, I could see the guy's face, I could see his hand gestures, I could see the people nodding. I knew worship was going on. Didn't know the language, but I didn't have to. All right, so now folks are gonna come and greet them. By the way, this is how they treated emperors. When an emperor would come, they people would travel down out of town to as far as they could get before the emperor got there and meet the emperor, greet them, and walk in with them. So they're treating Paul like they would treat an emperor. Uh, these guys walked 
43 miles from the Appy Forum to meet Paul and his entourage. They were really anxious to do this. Why? Remember, Paul wrote a letter called Romans. He wrote it before this happened. There were Christians in Rome. There were churches. There were believers. They were coming out to see the guy who wrote the letter that they studied in church every Sunday. Now remember, they didn't have the New Testament. They didn't have the Gospels. This guy named Paul wrote him a letter. And they treated that letter with great care and respect. At the end of every service, they'd roll it up and throw it away safely. The next service, the pastor would take it out, unscroll a piece of it, read it, and talk about it. All they had in that church was Paul's letter. They read it every Sunday. We want to see the guy that wrote us the letter. And they came out to meet Paul. Verse 16, they continued towards Rome. Now when we came to Rome, the centurion delivered the prisoners to the captain of the guard, but Paul was permitted to dwell by himself with the soldier who guided him. So, finally the promise of Jesus that Paul was going to get to Rome is fulfilled. I mean, that promise goes way back to the early chapters of Acts. At Jerusalem, Jesus promised Paul he would make it to Rome, and he did. Now at the very end of the book, the Apostle Paul gets to Rome. Thus Jesus' prophecy that his disciples would be witnesses to the end of the earth. Would you believe that somebody who wants me to vote for him is president? <laughs> All right. So, he's in Rome. He's at the end of the book. Now, Rome had existed for about 800 years at this time. The Colosseum had not yet been built. There were prominent buildings there that you would have known. The Temple of Jupiter, the Palaces of Caesar, and the Temple to Mars. At that time, the Roman population was about 2 million people. Now, let me give you the breakup of the 2 million people. There was a million slaves and a million non-slaves. So half the population of Rome was slaves. Now, not slaves like you think of, not slaves like on a plantation in the South, but slaves who were indentured servants, household servants, tradesmen, doctors, lawyers, guys with skills. So, the slaves were not necessarily lower class. Many of them had great skills and great learning. Many of them saved up enough money to buy their freedom. Centurion delivered his prisoner to the captain of the guard. Now, the Bible told us earlier this guy's name, it was Julius. He had treated Paul kindly. He had seen that Paul wasn't killed. He gave Paul great freedom. And now he's rid of Paul. He's your prisoner. I've done my job. By the way, he got everybody there alive. He got back, I'm willing to bet he got a promotion. He got the job done. He succeeded. Took him a long time. Took him a shipwreck. He got the job done. He got back, he was a Roman hero. Uh, now Paul is living in his own space. He's paying for his own rented house. He has a God. Sometimes the God is chained to him. Sometimes he's not, but there's a God with him. They change the God every four hours. And what this did was it gave Paul an unlimited supply of people to witness to him. And by the way, in Philippians chapter 1, it talks about Paul had won people from the Roman God to Jesus. So here's these big burly Roman gods that Paul's chained to, and he's talking to them and witnessing to them. Every time somebody comes in to visit Paul and Paul's witnessing to them, the guy's listening to it. And some of these gods got saved. God never wastes the situation. God never wastes an opportunity. All right, verses 17 through 20. Now, remember, Paul's one of those guys who kind of does the same stuff every time. Paul has a patent. Paul's patent is repeatable. So, 
go back in your head, early chapters of Acts. Every time Paul would go into a city, what's the first thing he did? He went to the synagogue, witnessed to the Jews first. Often they rejected him. Often they ran him out of town. Many times they tried to kill him. But Paul always went to the Jews first. He's now in Rome. Do you think Paul's pattern changes? Nope. He's going to reach out to the Jewish people. Verses 17 through 20. And it came to pass after three days that Paul called the leaders of the Jews together. So when they had come together, he said to them, Men and brethren. He's a fellow Jew. He's talking to his people. Men and brethren. Though I have done nothing against our people or the custom of our fathers, yet I was delivered as a prisoner from Jerusalem into the hands of the Romans. Now, the minute he says Romans, the Jews are going, who is? Remember, Jews didn't like Romans because Romans were the captives. Who, when they had examined me, wanted to let me go because there was no cause for putting me to death? But when the Jews spoke against it, I was compelled to appeal to Caesar. Not that I had anything of which to accuse my nation. For this reason, therefore, I have called for you to see you and speak with you because of the hope of Israel. I am bound with this chain. Now, a pretty even-handed presentation, not offensive to the Jews he's talking to. He's just feeling them out. So he calls them together. This is his practice to see the Jews first. Uh, he addresses them as men and brethren. So he wants them to know, hey, I was a Jew. I'm still a Jew. I'm just like you, except I now know the Messiah. But other than that, we're just alike. Uh, I've done nothing against our people or the customs of our fathers. So he hasn't violated the Jewish religion. He didn't violate the temple. He didn't bring a Gentile into the temple. He's done nothing against the Jewish law. He's got a clean conscience. And he wants them to know that. Verse 18, when they had examined me, that's the Romans, and they wanted to let me go. So Paul wanted them to understand that the Romans that he'd been held by were willing to let him go. Not one time, not any of the kings we read about, not any of the trials we read about did the Romans say, this guy's guilty. Every time they said, this guy hasn't done anything wrong, but if we let him go, the mob will be against us. But they never one time said Paul did anything wrong. So Paul explains to them, because of the fact, even though they, I hadn't done anything wrong, they acknowledged I hadn't done anything wrong, they wanted me killed, there was no way out, so I appealed to Caesar. So he just wanted them to understand that. And then he, again, to make sure they got it, to make sure they don't misunderstand, he says, not that I had anything of which to accuse my nation. Now, Paul doesn't have a problem with the Jewish nation. Paul doesn't have a problem with the Jewish people. Paul has a problem with the corrupt Jewish leadership. And he's very open about that. But he still loves the Jews. He still dies to see Jews saved. Now, Paul's still got a heart for the Jews. All right. These leaders are going to respond to Paul and his questions. Verses 21 and 22. Then they said to him, We have neither received letters from Judea concerning you, nor have any of the brethren who came reported or spoken any evil of you. But we desire to hear from you what you think. We want to know more. For well, concerning this sect, he's talking about Christians, we know that it is spoken against everywhere. So, they tell him they haven't received letters, nobody's come to talk to him. So these folks who were so anxious to get Paul killed hadn't spent the time trying to come to Rome because they knew it was hopeless. They just kind of gave up. But these guys say, you know, you know about this stuff, and we don't. We want to hear from you about this Jesus stuff. So they're going to set a time to, to do that. Verses 23 and 24. So when they had appointed a day, many came to his, 
to him at his lodging, to whom he explained and solemnly testified of the kingdom of God, persuading them concerning Jesus from both the law of Moses and the prophets from morning till evening. By the way, so he's done this day-long presentation, way longer than four hours. The whole time there's been a Roman soldier chained to him. The Roman soldier heard the whole story. We switched Roman soldiers and the next Roman soldier heard the story. Wait, the guy shaved him. He, he can't miss it. So Paul's got this whole Jewish audience. And he's got a captive Roman God hanging on to him. Verse 24. And some were persuaded by the things which were spoken and some disbelieved. So verse 23. He explained solemnly and testified from the law of God, persuading them concerning Jesus from both the law of Moses and the prophets. So, law of Moses is the first five books. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. So he's quoting them chapter and verse out of the law. He's going to the prophets. He's quoting from guys like Isaiah, talking about the Messiah. He's talking to a Jewish audience and he's using nothing but Jewish scripture to explain to them. He's, he's relating. He's using stuff they were familiar with. Okay? Some were persuaded. Now, let me make sure you get the word persuaded. Some believed. Some got saved. Some got born again. They got it. Their lives were changed forever. And some disbelieve. Now, understand. Here's probably the best apostle, best orator, best defender of the faith. I mean, if I was going to go to into a courtroom and argue for Jesus, and I get to call one witness, it's Paul. He's the guy I want. Hey, there was nobody better. And he didn't reach everybody. Some believed, some didn't. The gospel separates. It separates believers from unbelievers. But pastor, I keep telling folks about Jesus and nobody will listen. It's okay. I want you to know on your report card, God didn't give you enough because when you told somebody they didn't believe. You told somebody, guess what's on your report card? A plus. You told. That's your job. My job is to tell. My job is to not get people saved. That's the Holy Spirit's job. The minute I start counting, cutting notches on my gun belt for those people I've led to the Lord, I've blown it. I'm out of God's will. God's not going to use me anymore. And by the way, I know lots of guys cut notches on their spiritual gun belt. And they take great pride in telling you the exact number of people they've led to the Lord. I'm your pastor. I've led nobody to the Lord in my life. I've been privileged to be there when God reached somebody. I've led nobody to the Lord ever. I take no credit for it. If I, if I have any converts, it's people I beat into saying something before I knew better. And they said it, but it didn't mean anything. But me personally, me, John Donovan, I've led nobody to the Lord. Sometimes God allows me to be present when he brings somebody to salvation. I don't do it. You don't do it. Don't go home and beat yourself up because you told somebody and they rejected. All you were to do was to tell them. And by the way, you don't know if your job that day was planting the seed for the first time, watering the seed for the 50th time, you don't know what your job was that day. I don't know what my job is when I talk to somebody. I know it's the Holy Spirit's job to convict them of sin, not mine. Holy Spirit may or may not choose to do it on the day I'm talking to him. Maybe I'm reinforcing what the last guy told them, and he reinforced what the guy before him told them. It may take 50 people to get somebody to Jesus. That's okay. It's not about us. It's about him. I don't get credit. I don't keep count. I get very nervous when guys tell me 
how many people they've led to the Lord. Because it's that's the sound like they're taking credit for. It. So I'm going to tell you, Mike, my, my score is zero. I hope your score is zero. But I hope we're still telling them all the time. So Paul told, some accepted, some didn't. Paul's not going to speak to the folks who didn't. Now, Paul can be blunt. Blunt's okay. This is Paul being blunt. Verse 25 through 27. So when they did not agree among themselves, they departed. After Paul had said one word, Paul's one word turns out to be a verse. The Holy Spirit spoke quietly through Isaiah the prophet to our fathers, saying, Go to this people and say, Hearing you will hear, and shall not understand. And seeing you will see, and not perceive. For the hearts of this people have grown dull. Their ears are hard of hearing, and their eyes they have closed. Lest they should see with their eyes, hear with their ears, lest they should understand with their hearts and turn so that I should heal them. All right, verse 25. They didn't agree. So those folks who disagreed were going to leave. Folks who believe, they're excited. They're, they're whooping it up. They're excited. The other folks aren't. Paul says, you know, this is just like Isaiah said. And he goes through and he gives all the verses out of Isaiah. By, by the way, he's quoting Isaiah chapter 6, verses 9 and 10. So, they rejected. I mean, they've seen, they've heard. Paul's done everything you could do to get somebody to believe. He's given them chapter and verse. He's, you know, but all he could do, but they still didn't accept. All right. So, now he tells them what his next move is going to be because of all this. Therefore, let it be known to you that the salvation of God has been sent to the Gentiles. And they will hear. We're going to do this again. I want to make sure you're with me. But all the Gentiles in the room, raise your hand. That's us. Far as I know, none of us are Jewish. We're all Gentiles. This is all good news for us. This is where we get included. It was for the Jews. And now we've been added. I'm not Jewish. And I still get added. I still get included. I mean, I got reason to shout and sing and be excited and praising the Lord. They're, in, they're around the corner, I think. All right. Verse 28. Therefore, let it be known to you. So, he's telling them, you guys don't want it? I'm going to take the message to somebody else. And by the way, Paul's done that his whole ministry. Goes into town, goes to the Jews, goes to the temple, goes to the synagogue, gets thrown out of the synagogue, goes to the Gentiles. This is nothing new for Paul. Verse 29. And when he said these words, the Jews departed. So, some folks went and stomped off. Now, these guys that stomped off, Paul's heart's break. I mean, he's, he's, del he's delivered his soul. He said everything you can say to convince somebody. By the way, Paul knows what's coming. A few years down the road, 70 AD, Rome destroyed Jerusalem, destroyed the temple, leveled the city. Paul's trying to spare these people from that. All right. Now, Paul's going to spend two more years in Rome before his trial. Right. Nothing happened faster than the Apostle Paul's life. Remember, he was held in Caesarea for two years. At the end of two years, Roman law required if you hadn't convicted the guy, you had to let him go. They held on to him, didn't let him go, broke their own law to hold on to Paul. 
That was two years. He spent two years getting to Rome. Now he's going to sit in Rome for two years. Nothing was fast for the Apostle Paul. Then Paul dwelt two whole years in his own rented house and received all who came to him. You want to talk about home Bible studies? You want to talk about small groups? Paul's doing one every night for two years. What did he do? Verse 31. Preaching the kingdom of God and teaching the things which concern the Lord Jesus Christ with all confidence. Okay, the next one is just God's providence. No one forbidding him. He's in Rome. He's a prisoner. He's got a Roman guy. And he did a Bible study every day and nobody stopped him. There's God's provision. There's God taking care of him. Now it says he rented a house. He probably worked part of the day as a tent maker. Now, tent maker is a really lousy translation. Paul was a leather worker. He didn't make circus tents. He made leather clothing. He made leather sandals. You know, he made leather stuff. He didn't make tents. Poor, poor translation. He received everybody who came to him and he preached the kingdom of God with confidence. Now, Paul couldn't travel during those two years. But during those two years' times, in addition to nightly Bible studies, daily teaching, he wrote Ephesians, Philippians, and Colossians while a prisoner in Rome. Are you ready for this? Paul could multitask. By the way, he didn't have a laptop. I don't know how you do that without a laptop. I'm spoiled. I couldn't sit down and handwrite a message anymore. I couldn't. I think with my fingers. Now, by the way, here's this morning's message. It's 12 pages, and I typed it with one finger on each hand. All these years, I still type with two fingers. I could type, I typed a 40 page thesis with two fingers. God's gracious. Now, all you folks who can touch type with your eyes closed, I hate all of you. I sit here and do everything with two fingers. I had my wife type Marilyn's obituary. But I, two fingers. I don't know how Paul did it. I, he, Jotted off three letters in the midst of everything else that was going on. So I mean, I got a lot of respect for Paul. Now, the book of Acts just ends. It doesn't tell you what happened to Paul. We know between other biblical writings, I know between other historical commentators, that Paul was probably acquitted of these charges. Best estimates and the best numbers I get people to agree on was that after this, Paul was free for another four or five years. Nero then arrested him somewhere around 66, 67 AD, and he was then finally executed. But God just kept expending his time, letting him do stuff. Now, Paul came to Rome, through the city, the soldiers, the snake, all the stuff that happened, and God delivered him. God uses Paul to show us that if we're doing God's will, we cannot be stopped. Now, by the way, Paul did die. He died in God's time. He died when he had finished his job. I continue to believe that Christians are immortal will not die until God's done with us, until we've accomplished our mission. And then God's gonna call us home, which is not a bad thing, it's not a scary thing, it's a blessing. This afternoon we'll celebrate Miss Marilyn going home. That wasn't a tragedy, it was a blessing. From her body all the way to heaven, she was shot. And it wasn't in fear.
but let's enjoy. So nobody stopped Paul, nobody kept him from preaching where he was there. God's just now brought open doors for him, but he still left him chained to a guy. But he opened doors for him. Now, why did the story stop here? Well, Luke's writing the story. Luke had a job to do. Now, I don't know if I explained this to you in chapter one. I don't know if you remember back to chapter one. I think chapter one was last year. But what was the purpose of writing the book of Acts? Now, the book of Acts is a transitional book. It's the only transit. Well, basically, there's two transitional books in the Bible. I call I call Malachi as a transitional book. But this is the transitional book. This is from Judaism to Christianity. It's from Jewish Christians in Jerusalem to Gentile Christians in Rome. Now, what was the Great Commission? Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the ends of the earth. If you were a Jew in Jerusalem, Rome was the end of the earth. The Great Commission was accomplished. By the way, the book of Acts doesn't have an ending because the story is still being written. Every day, God writes Christians into his story. He's writing you and me into his story. It isn't over. As long as the Holy Spirit is alive and well and doing stuff, it's not over. Folks, it's not over till the trumpet sounds. When the trumpet sounds, it's over. The trumpet sounds, I'm going up if I'm still here. But until then, the story's still being written. We're still part of it. Folks can still be reached. Folks can still be saved. Folks can still be brought into the kingdom of God. That's the continuing mission. How many Star Trekkies do I have in the room? Okay. The continuing mission of the Starship Open Door Bible Church is to go out and reach people, to spread the gospel. I don't know how you do it, but our job is to fill lots of people with the gospel. We may do it at a yard sale going vendor by vendor telling folks about Jesus. We're going to do it any way God directs us. But the mission is still ongoing. We're still part of it. God's still working through us. God's still using us. The book isn't over. It goes on and on and on so we're caught up in the sky to meet the Lord. And then we're going to forever be with the Lord. Miss Marilyn's already there. I suspect she's got a table like set for all of us to come and have lunch with us someday. God loves us. God's good to us. God's gracious to us. And the story goes on. Peter, can I get you to come and push the button in a second? I'll say... If you're watching on the internet, thank you for being with us today at Open Door Bible Church. Please come and visit us, West Gossipy, New Hampshire, right next to McDonald's and the post office. You're always welcome. God bless. Mm -hmm.